Tonight on Reporting Scotland. A man from Stirling sentenced to three months in a Dubai jail is free to return home after the case against him is dropped. The court is told a mother had no love in her eyes for the daughter she's said to have murdered. A recruitment drive to encourage thousands of people to take up a career in nursery education and childcare. How digital technology is replacing the clipboard hanging on the end of the hospital bed. It allows them to spend more time talking to you um, without having to race around filling in forms. Also on the programme. The Rangers manager Pedro Cachinha says his players are an embarrassment. Good evening. An electrician from Stirling who was facing three months in prison in Dubai has been freed after the intervention of the ruler of the Emirate. Jamie Harron had been found guilty of touching a man's hip in a bar. But today all charges against the 27-year-old were dropped and he was handed his passport, allowing him to return to Scotland. Stephen Gordon has more. What was meant to be a two-day stopover in Dubai became a four-month ordeal for Jamie Harron. Yesterday was seemingly his darkest moment, sentenced to three months in prison for public indecency following an encounter in a busy bar in which he says he was simply steadying himself to avoid spilling a drink. But this morning it emerged that the appeal being prepared wasn't necessary. He was free to go by special order of the ruler of Dubai. He's now since gone to the police station. He has retrieved his passport. He's been told by the Dubai police that all sentences, charges, fines against him have been set aside, have been removed by Sheikh Mohammed, who's the ruler of Dubai. Uh, he is free to leave Dubai at any time and he is free to return should he so wish. The campaign group detained in Dubai say publicity was an important factor in Sheikh Mohammed's intervention. Billy Barclay agrees, another Scot with recent experience of being arrested then pardoned in Dubai. Oh, it's horrendous. Oh, you know, you're in a prison over there and you, you, you just didn't see, you didn't see anything, you didn't see the end. And uh, even when you're released from prison, you're, you're fighting for your passport. You're, you're, trying, you're, you're fighting politically to post for your passport. You can't get your passport back and you can't do anything to get it back. It's, it's their laws, it's their way. Throughout his ordeal, Jamie Harron's family felt unable to visit him, concerned that they themselves would fall foul of the Dubai authorities. This morning, after learning that he was free to leave the country and return to Scotland, his mum said that she was ecstatic. As well as his family in Stirling, Jamie shared his delight with Billy, a point of daily contact. I seen a Snapchat there film, you know, and he's, he's, he's laughing about having his passport and that, so he's obviously on cloud nine, which when I got my passport back, it was the biggest relief that I've ever had in my life, you know. <laughs> you're in a country, you don't even know if you're ever getting back, that's the truth. You, you, the law's in their hands, you're theirs, that's it. Until you're back on British soil, you say, you're, you're, you're not going to be happy. Detention say his representatives cost Jamie Harron more than £30,000. They say he's considering suing his accusers, but the immediate focus is on getting home as quickly as possible. Stephen Godden, reporting Scotland. A court has heard that a mother had no love in her eyes for the daughter she's accused of murdering. The comment came from the sister-in-law of Sadia Ahmed. She's accused of killing her 14-month-old daughter Anaya in Glasgow last year. Ms Ahmed denies the charge. Andrew Black reports. Nadia Ahmed, the sister-in-law of the accused, was giving evidence for a second day at the High Court in Glasgow. She was asked if she had concerns about how Sadia Ahmed cared for her daughter, Inaya. She replied, in Sadia's eyes, I never saw any love for Inaya. She did not look after her. Prosecutors say Anaya was assaulted by her mother at the family home in Drum Chapel, Glasgow, in April last year. The trial previously heard the 14-month-old died in hospital a few days later. Giving evidence, Nadia Ahmed was asked about a conversation she had with the accused a few days after Anaya's life support was switched off. She was asked by prosecutor Paul Kearney if the accused had talked about her intentions. Ms Ahmed responded, I asked her, did you come downstairs with the intention of taking Anaya upstairs and killing her? And she said yes. 
Asked about the demeanour of the accused, the witness replied she was completely normal. It seems as if this was nothing to her. The court heard that Nadia Ahmed initially told police that Anaya choked on food. The witness was asked if she'd thought about going to the police after this conversation. She replied yes, many times, but she said that Sadia Ahmed's father had threatened her and others. The witness was asked what did he say. She replied, he said if our daughter is in prison, then wait and see what will happen to all of you. Ms Ahmed said she had initially lied to the police. Defence QC Ian Dugud asked the witness if she was lying in court today. She replied no. Sadia Ahmed, who's 28, is accused of assaulting, force-feeding and murdering her daughter between February 2015 and April last year, as well as trying to cover up the crime. She denies all the charges against her and the trial continues. Andrew Black, Reporting Scotland, at the High Court in Glasgow. The First Minister has described plans to almost double the amount of free childcare places in Scotland by 2020 as transformational. But to make that happen means getting more people to choose childcare as a career. Well, today a recruitment drive began to encourage 11,000 people into the profession. These are Summer's reports. I'll hold it. There you go. What's next? There's plenty to be done at nursery school at this time of year. At the table with teacher Coral McAvenny, it's all about making Halloween magic wands. Phoebe, what's your magic wand going to do? It's going to make people small. It's going to make people small? Coral says it's a career with plenty of rewards. They look up to you. You're, you're a role model for them, so it's nice to get them so young when they're starting to learn things that we find so simple like sharing and putting their jack on that's that's a big deal for them and you know it's nice to be part of helping them achieve goals that are lifelong Tarview nursery in easterhouse is part of a pilot program it already offers 30 hours of free childcare places a week that's double the current provision by 2020 this should be the picture across scotland here in Easter House, over 100 children and their families are now getting access to these additional free childcare hours. The nursery says it benefits the kids that come here, but it also allows flexibility for the parents retraining or going back into work. The First Minister came to see it in action, doing a spot of pumpkin decorating along the way. She acknowledged key to all of this is encouraging people to choose childcare as a career. It's one of the biggest policies, if not the biggest policies we'll pursue over the next few years. It is transformational. It will increase the early life chances of young people, make life easier for parents, but also give a new career uh, option for many young people leaving school. Ryan is at the local high school. A future working with young children is something he's considering. He already coaches football and wants to take it further. When I go to coaching, Sometimes I can see the kids quite down, quite down, but when they come to football, they're up, they're excited, you know, they want to have fun. So I don't want to, I don't want to bore them. I want to get them in, having games, having fun time. When I see them leaving a smile face, that just that makes my day. 41% of the children who come here live in poverty. Easter House has high levels of deprivation. Research shows creating a positive experience in early years enhances opportunities later. That's why the staff want to get it right before school starts. Lisa Summers, reporting Scotland, Easter House. Plans to set a minimum price for alcohol in Wales has been unveiled, but will it encounter the same hurdles as minimum pricing in Scotland? Well, for the last nine years, the Scottish Government has been trying to bring in the measure, but it's faced opposition from a number of European countries and an ongoing court challenge from the whisky industry. But I'm joined by our political editor, Brian Taylor. So why are Wales doing this now? Chicken, it's a why and a when. We'll come to the why in a second. The when is that they want to emulate Scotland, at least the proposals that have been put forward forward in Scotland, but there are changes to the powers that the Welsh Assembly currently has, and they're concerned that those changes could include the removal the removal of the power to act in this particular area of, of alcohol control. There's a complete shake-up in the powers and they think that it could go uh, in the by-going as, as part of that. Uh, as for the why, it's basically the same reason as in Scotland, public health. Here's the view from Wales. We're making this change because we know that harmful and hazardous drinking has a big impact. 
For example, over 400 people die every year due to alcohol, and we know that uh, 50 of those deaths certainly could be avoided if we introduced this minimum unit price. Also, um, alcohol use has a big impact on the NHS as well. £120 million pounds, uh, is the cost to the NHS, and that's just of alcohol-related admissions to hospital. So bring us up to speed with what's happening yeah, in Scotland. Uh, as you mentioned earlier, it's nine years since the, this, this issue began to be examined in Scotland. It's five years since the Scottish Parliament voted in favour of minimum alcohol pricing. After a prolonged legal battle and consultation, the, the Scottish uh, Lords, Scottish uh, Law Lords uh, judges ruled that the, the plan was legal. But there's a, an appeal to the UK Supreme Court, not on whether it's a good idea, whether it's a bad idea, but whether it's legitimate within the powers of the Scottish Parliament. Parliament. Basically, the case by the opponents is to say that it's a barrier to trade and therefore breaches European Union law. The Scottish Government argument is, no, it's nothing to do with trade, it's nothing to do with sales, it's to do with alcohol misuse and therefore a health matter. The Scottish Ministers say they wait for that ruling. If it is in their favour, they will go ahead very quickly. To be continued. Brian, thank you. The Scotland Rugby International, John Hardy, has been suspended over alleged cocaine use. The Edinburgh forward, seen here in a headband, was suspended by club and country on Friday pending investigation. BBC Scotland has since learned it's because of alleged use of the drug. It's understood Hardy, who's 29 and has 16 caps, hasn't failed any drugs test. Now, it's a sight we expect to see in every hospital ward, a clipboard hanging at the end of a patient's bed. But in a world of handheld devices, Wi-Fi and apps, should the way our health is monitored not be a bit more high-tech? Well, at Glasgow's Golden Jubilee Hospital, things are changing. Suzanne Allen reports. Just a wee check of your blood pressure, okay. if you don't mind. If you've ever been an inpatient, you'll be familiar with this, routine checks on the vital signs. But instead of writing it on a pad at the end of the bed, this is how they do it at the Golden Jubilee Hospital. Digitally, on a tablet, with the information available for all medical and nursing staff to see on the ward. So far, patients like it. It's been very positive. The staff have been extremely helpful and positive. There are lots of staff um, and they come in regularly to do a lot of readings and tests and it's all programmed into what looks like a little iPad on wheels. And that seems to hold all the information and it's very efficient and it allows them to spend more time talking to you um, without having to race around filling in forms. It's the first time this type of technology has been used in hospitals in Scotland. All the patient information goes to a central hub. The hospitals say deteriorating patients can be spotted quicker. So for us as nurses, this system really saves us time um, because it's all integrated into the computer system itself. Um, we no longer have to write um, the observations onto a paper chart, so it means that we're not looking for patients' notes, um, which can take us as time, you know, so it's really a time saver. The Scottish Government say not to worry, your data is safe. Well, first of all, they should be assured of any uh, patient and information systems that are introduced are, are very robust and are safe in terms of the use of, of patient data. So all of that is assured. But it actually has the, the opposite effect in that freeing up staff time from doing paperwork enables them to spend more time in face-to-face -face contact with patients. And the aim is to have more technology like this on wards. Suzanne Allen, reporting Scotland, Clyde Bank. The financial regulator says it may take further action over the way Royal Bank of Scotland mistreated some small business customers. The Financial Conduct Authority had been looking into failings by the RBS division that dealt with some struggling companies. Well, our business correspondent David Henderson joins me. David, firstly, remind us of the background to this. Well, Jackie, this inquiry focused on whether a unit within Royal Bank of Scotland went rogue. This was the global restructuring group, part of the bank whose job it was to look after co companies that were struggling after the financial crisis. But the claim made by some customers was that instead of being helped, they were mistreated and those companies were forced into bankruptcy so that the bank could pick up assets on the cheap. Well, today we've had an interim report from the financial regulator. It has identified failings at the bank, but crucially, when it comes to that central allegation, it has ruled that the bank did not engage in what it's called systematic 
inappropriate treatment of customers. So in view of that, David, where does this leave those customers? Well, Royal Bank of Scotland have acknowledged mistakes. They have apologised again today and they have confirmed that they're setting aside £400 million to compensate those customers who were badly treated by the bank. The regulator has not finished with the bank either. It's saying it's now looking at whether it can take further action. And Police Scotland are on the case. They are looking into whether an investigation could be carried out. So where we are now, almost 10 years after Royal Bank of Scotland collapsed and had to be bailed out by the taxpayer, the bank is still mired in scandal and having to clear up yet another mess of its own making. Jackie. Thank you very much, David Henderson there. It's 16 minutes to seven, a reminder of tonight's top story. An electrician from Stirling, sentenced to three months in a Dubai jail, is freed after the case against him is dropped. And still to come, Dundee United manager Ray McKinnon is expected to leave the club following Saturday's Scottish Championship defeat. The death of a man following a disturbance near a pub in the southwest of Edinburgh is being treated as murder. 44-year-old Mark Squires was found with serious injuries in a lane next to the Longstone Inn in the early hours of Sunday. He was taken to Edinburgh Royal Infirmary, where he later died. Police are trying to trace a group of three men and two women who were in the area where the attack took place. Mark had moved to a takeaway to try and get a, a, a late night food. Uh, that was unfortunately closed, so he's moved back to the Longstone Inn. At that point, he's encountered a group of three males and two females. Um, there's an argument broken out. That's escalated uh, into violence and the, there's, Mark has been assaulted and murdered in the lane to, to the side of the Longstone Inn. The Prime Minister and the leader of the SNP at Westminster have clashed over what Brexit will mean. Theresa May said she was taking a positive and ambitious approach to the talks. But the SNP's Ian Blackford called on her to end what he called her catastrophic ideological flirtation with a no-deal scenario. Well, our Westminster correspondent David Porter joins us. They don't mince their words, David, do they? No, they don't. And I think there'll be far more of that to come in the days, weeks and months ahead of us on an issue as controversial as Brexit. For the best part of two hours, the Prime Minister was in the House of Commons behind me updating MPs on the outcome of the latest Brexit talk she has had with other European leaders in Brussels towards the end of last week. As you would expect, she put the best gloss on things. She said that she believed that important progress had been made, that she was positive and ambitious for the way the negotiations would go. But she also conceded on that vitally important question of finances, the so-called Brexit divorce bill, the amount that the UK will pay to leave the EU, that there was no meeting of minds. Also in exchanges with the SNP's Westminster leader, Ian Blackford, it became very clear that there was no common ground. Businesses need certainty and we need to know the details of our future trading relationship and any transition deal before the end of the year. It is absolutely critical that we stay in the single market and the customs union. Will the Prime Minister end her government's catastrophic ideological flirtation with a no-deal scenario? Take this off the table and do it today. Full membership of the single market and full membership of the customs union go with the jurisdiction of the European Court of Justice and freedom of movement. These are issues which were voted against when people voted to leave the European Union. They would, they would effectively mean that we would remain in the European Union and we are going to leave in March 2019. And renewed concerns today, David, about the impact of Brexit on business. Yes, some of the biggest business lobbying groups such as the Institute of Directors and the CBI say that they need a transitional deal for business and it needs to be agreed before the end of the year. Otherwise, investment and jobs will be put at risk. They've written to the Brexit Secretary, David Davis, basically saying to him, look, get a move on. It proves that in the world of business and politics, Brexit is still dominating everything else. Thank you very much, David Porter at Westminster. 
Sport now and Rangers' failure to reach the League Cup final has put their manager's job under scrutiny once more. Pedro Cuxinha said yesterday he's fully responsible for the defeat by Motherwell, but today he called his players an embarrassment. Alistair Lamont has more. As Motherwell celebrated reaching a national final, the Rangers manager was left to rue a second semi-final defeat in his seven months in charge. Yesterday, Pedro Cuxinha summed it up thus. I assume all the responsibility. I am the leader. I am the one that prepared them. By lunchtime today, that had changed to, I've told the players, you are embarrassing me. You are embarrassing our club. You are embarrassing our fans. It doesn't augur well when the manager you know, does a complete reversal from less than 24 hours. He was taking the blame. Now he's saying the players are embarrassing him, the club and the fans. It's worth noting as well that eight of the players that started yesterday were players that have come in since he joined the club. So is he saying it's his players that are embarrassing the club or previous players? It's a confusing message and I'm pretty sure the players will be equally confused as to what is the manager going on about. Managers will always tell you there is pressure to produce results, but certainly at a club the size of Rangers, an inability to win big matches like yesterday's semi-final will ramp that pressure up. Nonetheless, Pedro Cristina did take training uh, this morning. Now, that would suggest that a uh, parting of the ways is not imminent. However, uh, the Rangers chairman, Dave King, is in the country and clearly uh, discussions will be taking place as to progress being made or otherwise. Since Pedro Cachinha took over as manager in March, he's been in charge of 25 matches. Of those, Rangers have won 14. They've drawn four games and lost seven. How then do supporters view his future? I would think... Give him a little bit more chance, but uh, he's got to up his game. The Rangers' way is just to keep the managers, and we're not the kind of club that just let the managers go every time we're struggling. But uh, for the length of time he's been here and he's no managed three games in a row, mm -hmm. I think it is time to question his ability. I think this, is, this will be a big call for him. If, if things don't go well on Wednesday night, someone's going to have to change, I think. That game back here on Wednesday is against Kilmarnock, one you feel Pedro Caixinha simply has to win. Alistair Lamont reporting Scotland. Well, pressure then on Pedro Cuxinha at Rangers and even more on Ray McKinnon at Dundee United following back-to-back -back defeats in the Championship. He's about to part company with the Tannadise Club with an official announcement confirming his departure expected tomorrow. Keridin Idzan reports. Troubled times once again at Dundee United. Their second season in Scotland's second tier isn't going to plan and manager Ray McKinnon is about to pay the price with his job. For a former advisor to the United chairman Stephen Thompson, the next appointment has to be the right one. It's absolutely crucial. It's perhaps the most important decision that Stephen Thompson will ever um, have to make. Uh, if the club doesn't get up this, uh, this season, as I say, potentially it's, it's financially almost calamitous um, for them. So he needs to absolutely get the right man, the man that can motivate that dressing room, lead that dressing room and quickly make up the points deficit they're currently suffering from. United have only lost three league games so far this season, but back-to-back -back defeats in their last two matches seem to have moved the board to act. Currently fourth in the Championship, five points behind leader St Mirren, some fans are worried the club's being too hasty. He hasn't had a fair chance. I mean, they've almost made it last season. Why not give me? They've lost two games on the trot. Any that can happen to any team, quite honestly. I sometimes worry about the way they get rid of people because it doesn't always change too good when the next person comes along. So I'm not sure it is the right thing. It doesn't seem long since United were in the top half of the Premier League and contesting the League Cup final. Jackie McNamara's reign lasted two and a half years. He was replaced by Mixu Patalainen. And when he couldn't keep them up last year, Ray McKinnon was brought in to try to get United promoted. Faith in him has now run thin, and it's expected United will now turn to their fourth manager in as many years. McKinnon did lead Dund United to last season's Premiership playoff, but that ended in defeat to Hamilton Ackies. So who might they turn to next? I understand the man who led Inverness to the Scottish Cup, John Hughes, is amongst those being considered. And a former Dundee United striker, Jim McIntyre, who lost his job as Ross County manager recently, would, like Hughes, be available to start work immediately, should the call come. It's expected McKinnon's departure will be announced tomorrow, once the lawyers have finalised his exit package. Kerdian Edsan, reporting Scotland.
So if the weather is relentlessly bad, what does that mean for weather presenters? Oh, we'll either be out of a job, Jackie, or busier than ever. Uh, That's what I think. Okay. <laughs> Good evening to you all. Well, the day today has ended up being cloudy and quite damp for many too. We've had quite a messy weather story, a deep area of low pressure in the Atlantic and around it, weather fronts approaching the British Isles, bringing with it cloud, rain, breezy conditions and south Easterly air and this west southwesterly air, and this bringing in milder conditions. So it has been mild today and it will be mild tomorrow too. But there were some moments of brightness. This, the scene sent in from one of our weather watchers in Dumfries and Galloway this afternoon with some brighter skies. And as we head into the evening and overnight, it will become dry for a time and there will be some clearer spells too. Here's the rain clearing the, towards the east, and we're left with drier weather for a time for much of the country, turning quite chilly across the north and northeast. Here, temperatures dipping to around five or six degrees for some sheltered glens. Further towards the west, though, more in the way of cloud by the end of the night, strengthening winds to southerly gales for a time across the west coast and outbreaks of rain and temperatures dipping to around 10 or 11 Celsius. So it means in the west, the day starts off cloudy and wet, some of that rain heavy at times, quite windy too, but it will clear further eastwards during the course of the morning, improving by the afternoon. We'll have some sunny spells, but also some blustery showers. So if you're heading out around four o'clock, for the south, much drier, brighter too, and quite mild, temperatures reaching 16 or 17 degrees for the Lothians and the Borders. Further towards the north here, the best of any brightness across parts of Aberdeenshire, the Murray Firth coast area. Across the northwest, some heavy blustery showers, maybe even the odd rumble of thunder, and cloudy and wet for much of the day across Shetland. During the evening, those showers become more frequent across the northwest and we'll have thicker cloud and rain approaching the south of the country too and it remains breezy. By Wednesday, though, that rain will clear. We're left with frequent blustery showers across the northwest, but elsewhere, for the south and east, fewer showers, more in the way of drier weather and temperatures 13, 14 Celsius. That ridge of high pressure briefly tries to build for Thursday too. Very similar conditions, showers in the northwest, dry in the south and east. That's your forecast. Thank you very much, Corso. Now, a reminder of tonight's main news. Theresa May has told MPs that Brexit talks with EU leaders last week made important progress, but a leaked account of her meeting with Jean-Claude Juncker, the head of the European Commission, has suggested that she begged for help because she was politically weak. Mr Juncker has said the story, which appeared in a German newspaper, was inaccurate. And an electrician from Stirling who was facing three months in prison in Dubai has been freed after the intervention of the ruler of the Emirate. Jamie Harron had been found guilty of touching a man's hip in a bar. But today all charges against the 27-year-old were dropped and he was handed his passport, allowing him to return to Scotland. And that's Reporting Scotland. I'll be back with an update of the main stories just after the 10 o'clock news. Join us then, if you can, from everyone in the country. Goodbye.